Come on in, y'all. Come on in, y'all. It is time for some Bible study. This should be, um, well, interesting, to say the least. Mm hmm Yeah. Come on in. Come on in. We are getting ready to talk about James chapter 3 to see if we can make sense of uh, the tongue. It is a very popular study and needs to be talked about and dealt with in detail. Here we go. Here we go. Hold on, y'all. Hold on. Here we go. Five, four, three, two. Hello, everybody. So, Walter Jones Show. I am he. It is Thursday, 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 Theology Thursday. It's the day we sit around the mic and talk about the Bible. The B I B L E, man, that is the book for me. I am so excited to be here today in Chicago. It is getting ready to snow hard. We're about to get a good foot of snow tonight, tomorrow, the whole weekend. And what you got, just, just got to deal with this. This is February in Chicago, 2018. And well, it is part of the, the monster, the beast that we live in, Illinois. Nobody's surprised. Nevertheless, the show must go on. For those of you who are interested in Sunday school, I still got you. Uh, a disciplined faith out of James 3. We're going to talk about the first verse all the way to the 12th verse. Uh, the Bible truth is James says that we should control our tongues so that only blessings come from it. That memory verse, we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, let's get this uh, show on the road. I tell you, I'm excited here. <laughs> My brother, El Elder Rodney Jones, is on assignment in Phoenix, Arizona. Pray for him. And my other brother, Larry Jones, there as well for the annual conference uh, there. Um, James, I tell you, last week we kind of touched on it a little bit. This one here is probably one of the most taught, most discovered and examined chapter in the book of James, uh, especially, gosh, all through the New Testament. <clears throat> this particular chapter here is deadening to many of your ears because in many cases people don't know what to do with their tongues other than make it do things that it was not supposed to do. God didn't design it for it to do. And I'm talking about uh, the utterance of the mouth. I'm not talking about anything physical other than the utterance. So I'm going to go here with NLT because it brings up uh, the scriptures and it opens up a light, a little more understanding than most of you who uh, read King James. It kind of confuses you, and I get it. I understand. But NLT will make it plain. All right? Let's get to the history of James. A couple of shows ago, we talked about the content of the book and the purpose. James is primarily practical, and, and it's an ethical book. It emphasizes duty rather than a whole bunch of doctrine. Everybody looking to the Bible for a lot of doctrine, and you are so heavenly minded, but you ain't no earthly good. So James kind of give you some of the good in the earth, all right? The author wrote to rebuke shameful neglect of doing certain Christian duties, all right? In doing so, he analyzed the nature of genuine faith, and he urged his readers to demonstrate the validity of their experience with Christ. And, accept, and not all that uh, church talk and church culture that uh, we are so guilty of. The world don't like to talk to us because we're so holy minded. Uh, his supreme concern was reality in religion. And he set forth the practical claims of the gospel. He didn't get caught in all of the spiritual talk that we do today. We need spirit. We need to, to, to examine it and live by it and what have you. But we need to understand what this faith is from last week. For without the works, it's dead. So James uh, focused more so on the works and the practicality of a man's life, more so. Uh, the book called for ethical living based on the gospel provides its relevance, and James gives a practical exposition of pure religion and undefiled. You have to go to first uh, James 1 and 27, what is pure religion and undefiled? It says something there that many of us uh, Christians are guilty of not doing. Uh, his two fundamental emphasis are personal growth 
in the spiritual life and sensitivity in social relationships. And any faith that does not deal with both personal and social issues, yeah, well, that's a dead faith. And the message of James speaks especially to those who are inclined to walk their way uh, into heaven. You, you know, they, they talk their way into heaven, that is, all right, instead of walking their way there. All right, some people want to pay their way into heaven. You think because you're paying a tithe and an offering and God's going to sh shelter you and, and uh, shoot you from a slingshot into heaven, and you are sadly mistaken. Uh, so chapter 3 here, I'm going to read it in the NLT. First, the, uh, the King James says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive a greater condemnation. People read that and think slavery when they see that. And unfortunately, again, you have not analyzed uh, 1611 Old English Shakespearean. And you got to be careful when you read certain words because in, uh, in the English language, things tend, tend to change. So let's go to NLT to see if we can make a little more sense of it so that uh, many of you who are not Bible students uh, can get it. A brilliant Scott blessings to you. Uh, dear brothers, it says, dear brothers and sisters, all right? They added sisters in here. King James says, brethren. Brethren, that means it wasn't just men in the, in the, among the body of Christ. So that's why NLT says, dear brothers and sisters. And I know some people who uh, fight against different um, translations of scriptures, but the King James, like I said yesterday, is a translation. King James is not the original Bible. There was a few before it, believe it or not. I know it's shocking to many of you. But there it is. Uh, Brian Washington, blessings to you. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Oh, boy. Man, this is hard right here. Those of you who call yourselves teachers, do you understand what you're asking God for? He that desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing. But after that, you got to keep reading because there's a pecking. There's a, there's a qualification there. The resume on that thing right there will X out quite a few of us who desire that office of a bishop. Well, same way here, he's talking to teachers. He said, you may not want to be a teacher, okay, because you're getting ready to be held under strict judgment. Yeah, indeed, we all make uh, many mistakes, he said. Oh, what an honest, what a, what a beautiful contriteness here. We all make mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Oh, man, there's something about the tongue and the heart that the Bible had to deal with that is not very popular. The, God, the heart, many people, especially sinners, say, don't judge me because God knows my heart. And your heart, like I said yesterday, God says it's wicked. Continually, it's wicked. And then the question came forth, who can know it? Nobody knows that heart. So you say he knows your heart. God says, yeah, I sure do know your heart. Your heart is evil. So is your tongue, some of you. I've seen more saints shoot others down than more than I've seen the world shoot each other down. It's amazing. If the world loves its own, but the church is divided. Even today with this music, the whole Snoop Dogg saga is going on. The Ty Trippett saga, who Ty Trippett was on. Um, Jimmy Fallon last night. And, and men, the church is divided. It's not nothing new. The clock sisters was on the Grammys back in the 1980s. The church was divided. God, it goes all the way back. Well, I'll talk about that tonight on the on my show tonight. I ain't, I'm not going to. Y'all just got to go back and hear what I got to say about that tonight. All right. It says here, verse 3, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. I think the picture and the contrast or the pictures that he used here, metaphorically things that he used, um, is picture perfect. Because notice the descriptions that he used to show you how powerful the little tongue is. Because I don't know if any of you ever been up and near close to a horse. A horse is huge. A horse is a horse, of course. Of course. It's huge. The head on a horse 
is bigger than my whole body almost. But it's amazing. Uh, don't let a horse sit on you. Uh, it will it, it will kill you or crush you, some of you. I know me because I weigh, I weigh about a buck and a quarter. But it's amazing, the contract, the, the, uh, the picture here, that he says that we can take a bit and put it in that big old horse's mouth and a small rudder. Have you ever seen these men who race in the Kentucky Derby? They're about this tall, all right? They're about three feet tall, and you can pick them up with one hand. And they'll eat their dinner and go into the bathroom and vomit it out because they have to be a certain size, a certain weight, these, these runners, because they don't want to overweigh the horse mm -hmm, in the races. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? But it says here, uh, uh, you put the bits in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the mouth of the horse. It says, and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. I think King James says, wherever the, the uh, governor listeth, okay? Even though the winds are strong, uh, those of you who ever uh, went and got on a ship, you went on those cruise ships, and you could put a couple thousand people on that ship out there in that big body of water, the Pacific or the Atlantic, and that the and the and it's in the, the waves are beating against that ship. It says it didn't. It doesn't even matter about the wind. A little skinny guy like me, because I've written on a yacht before, and I took the wheel of that yacht, and I turned that wheel right, and that big old yacht with all them rich folk on it turned, and then I turned it left, and them, that, that whole big old yacht turned left. But I did it with one little finger. The owner of the yacht. Uh, he uh, said, you want to drive? I said, yes. And, and I just turned it with one finger, and that whole yacht turned. How amazing is that? And it says here, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. Oh, man, have y'all ever met somebody who loves to sit or stand in your churches and use big words? They stand, the Bible says, alluded to the people stand on the steps of the temple and use all these grandeur words. It also said something about vain janglings. People use these words and they teach, they're teachers of the law, but they don't even know what the law means. Y'all ever experienced any of that? Y'all see that today in your churches, on your job, among your family, brothers and sisters? Uh -huh. Brentick says we educators in the public school system are held to higher standards of morality by our state boards. And so why wouldn't God make the teachers of his word more accountable? Ooh, Brentick. Mm -mm -mm. Brentick has been blessing me for the past hour. Yes, he has. It says here, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. I watch the National Geographic a lot. I watch the History Channel a lot. I watch Animal Planet a lot. And I see how it's amazing. A one little spark can burn down a forest. Sometimes it's spontaneous combustion. Sometimes it happens because of the sun. Sometimes it happens because it hadn't rained in a while. And look at California. Many of those fires started by one little match. By a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, here it is, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, an entire world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. And it can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. There is a statement that men like to use, uh, hell has no fear. What is it? Hell has no something like a woman's wrath. No, is that is y'all type to what I what what they say? Because I always get it wrong. Hell has no fury, uh, like a woman's wrath or something like that. Well, that's like the that's the tongue. This this contrast here is shocking to to read and, and understand. But it's so true. I've seen people speak to other people and literally kill them. 
I've seen people commit suicide because of what somebody said about them. I remember being a young, I was too young to take criticism. Today I take criticism like a grain of salt. I really don't care. YouTube cussed me out a lot. They called me all kind of names and they, they, they say things that I can't repeat on this show on YouTube. And I read them and I crack up when I see them. Why I'm able to do that? Because I'm more mature now. I have built a chest uh, of stone, okay? So that kind of stuff don't hurt me because I knew what I was getting myself into when I started the Sir Walter Jones Show. And I picked these topics because I know the people who really hurt me the most are the believers. The unbelievers don't hurt me at all. The unbelievers. Sinners sin. So why should you be upset when sinners sin? That's what they do. But when you go to a hospital and the hospital molests you, the hospital abuse you, then you, that, that hurts a lot. That man who they gave 175 years in jail, he was molesting these children. P parents were bringing them to this man and he was molesting them. That's not a place you would think. I mean, I could see going to a club or bar or, or a crack house, okay? But to the hospital? for healing, but go there for abuse. And so uh, I, I, I see why it hurts so, pe so many people when they bring up the word or the phrase church hurt. Church hurt hurt a whole lot of folks more so than the world hurt them. So when people talk about me on Facebook and social media, I laugh because <laughs> I say I must be doing something right. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Oh, but when it's those who should know better, and I believe Jesus died of a broken heart. No man took his life. He took his own life. Jesus died of a broken heart. Blood and water came gushing out of him. He began to sweat blood. Okay, and water come out of, his, out of him. And hydrosis, uh, something like that, the medical term is. He was just distraught because he was betrayed by the very ones who... He said that they love him until when he came back, he had to go back to Peter and, and say, listen, you need, I need to renew both of us, all right? Peter, do you love me? That wasn't just for Peter. I believe it was for Christ himself because he, he still was 100% man and he was Christ as well, all right? So I remember being a young man and I remember uh, people, when I remember leaving a room and getting ready to turn back around and go in the room, and I stopped at the door, and these, these people, my family, was talking about me. They were talking about how nasty, how, how dirty I was, how smelly I was, how much how my, how my hair was always uncombed and nappy. And that made me feel lower than dirt. <clears throat> and I couldn't walk back in that room. I had never felt so much hurt and pain in my life I don't even know. Well, I'm sure I've felt pain since then, and I can I can pinpoint it when it happened because I, I expressed it on this show. But for years, I had not felt the pain from these people's words. They were my they were my family uh, saying it was not my brother. So don't y'all call them. It wasn't them. It was it, they were cousins. They were related, and they were saying things about me that hurt me to the core that it was hard for me for years to talk to them. I was young, and it wasn't nothing that they threw at me. It was just their utterance. It's what they said. Anybody experienced that? Anybody on here experienced that before? Where family and friends just said something about you, and you had to go into hiding, and you just couldn't take it anymore? Sometimes, I mean, I don't go into hiding anymore today when people talk about me. I'm above that. <clears throat> but I still feel a sense of loss when when relatives and friends <clears throat> who's supposed to know better say things, and I says that hurts uh, like a woman scorned. Thank you, Stephen. People in the church hurt people. Yes, and the reason why they hurt people is because they're hurt, and they all say that hurt people hurt people. Lady Rochelle says. Uh, Michael uh, Freeland says um, things James compared the tongues to are a bit and bridle used for horses, a small rudder to guide ships, loose lips sink ships. <laughs> it can also sink other ships as well. Friendships, come on, come on. Relationships, church fellowships, to name a few. Man, this is good. And deadly poison. I would compare the tongue to a uh, mosquito. 
It may seem uh, small, but it kills nearly one million people every year. Michael Graylin Freeman just shut this show all the way down. I think that was one of the greatest comments I've heard all year. Um, so it's uh, verse 6, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue of the flame of fire is a whole world of wickedness, corrupt and entire body. Your entire body, it corrupts, and it can set your whole life on fire. Verse 7 says, uh, people can tame all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. Woo, Lord have mercy. Are y'all are y'all getting this from James? I think Abronia said something. She says, nope, but uh, when one of your church friends said what uh, she said about me, I just wish that, uh, okay, <laughs> I, can't, I can't read the rest. I have to always vet in my mind what Abroni going to say first before I go public. So I, <laughs> I ain't saying no more. Okay, people can tame all kinds of birds and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. Mm -mm -mm. Nobody. It is a restless, it is restless and it's evil. Full of deadly poison. Anybody ever had food poisoning? You know what it feel like? Where you feel like death? Been there a few times. You went to bed, fine. You had a good dinner. But around 3 or 4 in the morning, there was a rumbling going on in the belly. A rumble in the jungle. And you don't know what's going on. And then you find yourself leaping out of your bed trying to find the toilet. And we take the toilet for granted. But then the toilet becomes your best friend in the time of poison. Poison, poison, poison. Okay? And uh, you find yourself living in the restroom. On the floor. Your, your, your temperature rise because there's a virus in there attacking. And your, your blood, your, um, your vessels or your blood or whatever it is, is trying to fight against this attack, and there's a war going on in your members, but it's affecting you, and you feel like death, and you're constantly vomiting, but you uh, you ex ex extracting on both ends through your upper part of your body and the lower part of your body is extracting at the same time. Anybody ever had that? Oh, trust me, you feel like death. Well, that's the tongue, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises, watch this, sometimes it praises our Lord and Father. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. Oh, Lord, Lord, yes. bipolar, some of y'all are. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. We, uh, we take what God has given us and we use it for good and bad. Even our music, uh, we, we just, and the world is confused at us. It says sometimes we praise God with it, and other times uh, we curse. We curse those who have been made in the image of God. That's why I testify sometimes about my wife, my ex-wife, and how I told y'all, even though we're divorced, we never treat any, each other unseemly. We don't treat each other like we're strangers and that we're enemies. We never do that. If you see me and my ex-wife in public, you'd say you'd almost think that we still were married. Not that we're touching each other and like that, but we act so cordial with each other. Why? Because my ex was made in the image of God, and she knew I was too. And how could the body of Christ act this way, even in the, in the midst of divorce? Divorce should have never happened, first of all, but since it did happen, there still is an image of God that we have to deal with here. And we act like one happy family when we're together. Not too many Christians have this kind of testimony, and I think it's sad. So we curse, uh, we praise God with one, in one instance, and we take the same tongue, and curse those who are made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Amazing. 
Surely, my brothers and sisters, he says, this ain't right. Uh, he says, does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? No. Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? Mm, no, 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 he says. And no, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Oh, this, this, this right here, this is the issue. This, this right here, this, I, I just, it's hard. Now, the, the lesson stops at verse 12, all right? Then it goes into the true wisdom of God, okay? If you are wise and, and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life. <laughs> It's all in the proof. It's all in the proof. Doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom, but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and then lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly. It's unspiritual. And he says, it's demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Let me read this next, next, next few. It says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace, loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is a full mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Now watch this. The word is peacemaker. Notice the word when you break it down. Peace maker. All right. Y'all keep using the word peacekeeper. Same as peacemaker. Okay. Um, let's see. This is verse 18. Let's see what King James say. Uh, yeah, make peace. Okay? See, peace maker, of course, is an action word. A peacekeeper, in my analogy, is a state of being. Oh, man. Ain't too late to rekindle the flame, Doc. Brentic, no, no, Brentic, no, bro. That, that ship. <laughs> Y'all know what he's talking about, right? Um, <laughs> a peace keeper is a state of being. A peacemaker is a person who does something. He causes peace. He is the mediator like a middle child is in a family. Ah, oh, man, I don't know. I don't know if I should be doing this. I I don't know. I don't know why I go here, but I do. Okay? <laughs> I do. A peace maker is the person who, when you call them on the phone and say, have you heard about the, the latest scandal on Sir Walter Jones? Now, a peacemaker's response would be, no, I ain't heard about it, but let's pray. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm getting in all kind of trouble. Okay? No, I, I ain't heard about that, but let's pray right now. You see, and then the person who called that ain't the answer they're looking for. No, they're not looking for that one. They want you to ask them what happened and what can we do to spread this scandal. That's the church. That's the body. It's the body of Christ. Seems to be more divided than the world. Beelzebub is not divided. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say Beelzebub can't be divided. They're not designed to be divided. Jesus was doing an act 
And they said, the Pharisees said he was doing this in the name of a demon. And Jesus said, it's impossible. I can't, he says, Beelzebub can't cast out Beelzebub. Can't do it. So the peacemaker is a person who when, when stuff come, whether it's true or false, when they come to you, you say, let's stop this right here and see what we can do to help his situation. You see, when a dog brings a bone, a dog carries a bone. Mm -hmm. And so when you get yourself caught up in uh, the, the, the smoke screen of somebody else's issues, what's going to happen is once you become uh, in, involved in it, then you're going to become involved. You see, in the court of law, many times, if I commit a crime and I tell you about my crime, you are now involved. No, you won't be punished, but and they will punish you as if you did a crime. No, but you are involved because they're going to want to know from you, did he come to you and what did he say? You're not involved. A peacemaker is a person who will, will say, you did what? Um, 911, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what a peacemaker would do because now and he, you need to be freed of this because somebody's going to subpoena you. <laughs> And uh, they're going to be asking you a bunch of questions. Um, Natalie Woods drowned suspiciously in 1981 uh, and uh, on the boat. And there were, let's see, two, four, five, maybe six people on that boat. That was 1981. And they figured the case is over. And we don't know it was an accident. But they brought the case up again in 2011. And then they brought it up again this week. Some things never die. And this man now, the husband, forgot his name. Uh, you remember him? He played a, a detective. Is it Heart to Heart? I think it is. Heart to Heart. Robert uh, Wagner. Yeah, Robert Wagner. Thank you, D. Curtis. And uh, he in his 80s now, he don't want to talk to nobody. He didn't cooperate to nothing like that because... The one who really know what happened is Robert Wack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't want to be an accessory to a crime. When people bring these words to you, you better shut it down or 20 years from now, you're going to be subpoenaed by the Lord. <laughs> I just, this is, I'm, I'm trying not to be too poetic. So your tongue is evil. It's poison. It's a world of evil. And no man can tame it. And you have to tame it yourself, uh, bridle it, and ask God, what, what, from, what can I do with this tongue? Because it has destroyed men. Literally, utterly destroyed them. Galatians 5 brings up some wonderful things that helps us understand how we should live by. And I know people say, that the speaking in tongues is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And I would like to tell you yes and no. <laughs> because I know a lot of people uh, who are um, speaking in tongues and they don't really live the life behind the tongue. It makes you wonder what kind of tongue it is. Because the Spirit of God don't dwell in uncleanness. So it makes you wonder. I've seen worldly people speak in some tongue. Mm -hmm. um, so the evidence, of the real evidence of the Holy Spirit is called the fruit. Yeah, you will know them by their fruit. Here it says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. This is important because it is, break, it is broken up in three sections. The first section is just like the, uh, the Ten Commandments is broken up, I think more so in twos. And I believe this is why Jesus gave us two commandments. He didn't give us two new ones in a sense, 
He gave us just one. He said, the, the first one you obey, but I'm going to give you a new commandment to love your neighbors as you love yourself. He broke it up in two because you break up the Ten Commandments in two. The first uh, talks about your relationship with God and the rest is your relationship with mankind. And the fruit of the Spirit is the same way. The first three, I believe, it, it concerns our attitude, of course, towards God. Love, joy, uh, uh, peace. That is God, okay? And I think this second one, this second triad, it deals with our social relationships uh, with people, all right? Long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. But this third one here, it describes our principles that guides a Christian conduct that's within ourselves, okay? If that makes any sense to any of you. That, that temperance and meekness and faith Okay, so it's broken up in three. Your relationship with God, your relationship with people, and your relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. People are supposed to look at you and never hear you talk and say, that's a good man. That's a good woman. The Spirit of God is in that person. Why? Demons pick up on stuff. Demons know God, believe in him, and they tremble. Demons are supposed to tremble when you walk in rooms as well. They pay close attention to your actions. Uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, I, I, I uh, like to quote him a lot, said, uh, preach the gospel and if need be, use words. Um, so when you open your mouth, in many cases, Christians, they run away from you. Because they say to themselves, how could you talk to me this way and call yourself a Christian? And I think this is why many people hate the word Christian. And we're going back into history. We hate that word. We don't like to use it. I don't like to use it today. I really don't like to use it. It was a derogatory statement, a word in a sense. And they were called Christians at Antioch. That's when they first were called it. And look at them Jesus people, them Christians, all right? It's like how we call Hispanics back in the, we call them Chicanos. I dare you walk up to a Hispanic right now and call them a Chicano. You, 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 uh, you might want to get you some good insurance. Um, you know, African Americans, we've been called all kinds of stuff. But I dare a white man walk up to any black man and call them colored. I, I dare you, you know? I'm not even talking about the N-word. I'm talking about just call them colored. <laughs> hey, colored, come here. You know, you just don't do that. So Christian was, was not something that people really wanted to be a part of. But after a while, that word became a part of people who, well, eh, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violence take it by force, which means now a whole bunch of people wanted to be Christians, and so uh, the, the gospel was preached, and people start pressing up against the, the kingdom. So the kingdom of heaven suffered violence. It's these people who wanted to get into the kingdom. All right? We talked about that already, and I don't want to confuse y'all. Hey, David, brought blessings to you. All right? So this tongue is something. And what can we do, what do we need to do to get people on the straight and narrow about educating them on how to speak to us or how you should speak to them? Well, Funny thing, a lot of times I learn more about decency of character and communication from the world in many cases than I do when I stand among Christians. Now that's a shame. Uh, Brentick said, color just means you want to call me the N-word, but, <laughs> but no, you can't. That's right, Brentick, man, that's so true. Um, because in the South, still today, some white people still use the word color uh, because they were born under that climate. But what do we do about the tongues, okay? It should not be named among us this type of division. A typical Sunday or Bible study, whenever you're in the church or in the house of God, somebody step on your toe. Funny, funny thing, though. Somebody step on your toe, and you are so upset because the person didn't say, I'm sorry. That's a... Brentick, that's the weirdest thing to me. They might not even know they stepped on your toe. And because they didn't say, I'm sorry, 
You go week after week after week and won't talk to them. You refuse to speak to them. Funny thing. I've seen more decency on the train, the subway, than I have in many of our churches. Weirdest thing. Weirdest thing. The conduct of the believer. So, the Apostle Paul had to write, he'd written more of the New Testament scriptures than any man we know, any man or woman that we know. And, and it seems like him, when he would write, he wrote about Christian conduct. And he says, y'all are doing things <laughs> that are not even named among the Gentiles. It's just, it's not even named among Gentiles. How is this even possible that y'all doing the stuff that y'all doing and saying the things y'all saying, and when I go into the world, I seem to find more peace and tranquility among unbelievers. I believe it's the trick of the devil. I believe we've been hoodwinked, run amok, and Plymouth Rock did land on us. It's a shame. So, the teaching of the gospel have been tainted. And what have we put in place of teaching of the gospel? Prosperity. Word of faith. That means speak it. You see, word of faith and prosperity go hand in hand today because usually uh, the prosperity is preached and teached in our pulpits. It's always about financial gain. And then the word of faith is speak those things, and that's speaking usually refers to <clears throat> financial gain. And the preaching of holiness got kicked out of the church. We don't speak about it anymore. We don't. We walked away from it. Number one, it's not lucrative. You can't make much money. You can't sell many tapes on holiness, no. That's, that's your granddaddy's sermons. Funny thing about scripture, it ain't changed. And the even funnier thing about God is he never changed either. But we've changed his message. And we put more emphasis on what feels good and this is not nothing new because in the Old Testament, they wanted a prophetic word, and those words were smooth sayings. They said, give us smooth sayings. Give us something sweet and soft. Don't tell us about our sins and what we're doing wrong. We don't want to hear anything like that. We want to know, am I going to get this new job? Uh, the car I was looking at at CarMax, is God going to grant me that car? I saw a house. I know I can't afford it, but God says I can have whatever I want to. It cost, my, it cost about $350,000. And I know I only make $30,000 a year, but God said I can have it. So where's the prophet? The prophet comes to town, and y'all go following this prophet all over. He, go, he hop from church to church, and y'all follow them all over the place, waiting for him to pick you out like a game show. The price is right. And you make sure you get there early so you can sit on the front row or as close as you can because you want his eyes to spot your eyes because he can, oh, the prophet looked at me. Even though he didn't call my name out, he looked at me, which means that word he gave to that sister must be to me as well because when he was talking to her, he glanced over at me. That means I'm going to get that house he promised said that the, the sister is going to get. And you leave there with these hopes and dreams and aspirations. And how is it possible that you can go to a church, God's house, and not really feel the man of the house? I just, I can't understand. Back in the day, when, if you went to someone's home, you spoke to the man of the house. You spoke to the priest of the home. You brought a gift to the house. So welcome. Okay? That's the way it was back in, in the day. Decency and chivalry is the way it was. The, the, if someone came up to the house, the man didn't go hide in the basement. He didn't go into the manhole because somebody came up to the house. No, the man, if anybody come over to my house right now, if, if I was home and my children were home, and they invited a friend over to the house. I'm coming upstairs because my office is in the lower level of my house. 
I'm coming upstairs. I want to see who in my house. Who do my children? I trust my kids, but don't, I don't, that don't mean I trust their guests. Who is this in my house? Who are you? Are you here for Rebecca? Oh, okay. I want you to see my face, and I want you to hear my voice. And I need you to know that I'm the man of the house. Mm -hmm. So many of us go to the house of God and never once meet the man of the house, the owner of the house. I, I know I shouldn't be, I'm not calling God a man, but I think y'all, hopefully y'all understand what I'm, the analogy I'm trying to make. The high priest, you never met the high priest of the house. You just meet the messenger of the house, the, the willing workers of the house, but you never meet the priest of the house. That's a problem. And many of our churches are designed that way. Talk to the messengers, and they tell us what to do. I believe the prosperity doctrines are the reason you have Paula White and some black coons, I mean preachers, <laughs> endorsing Donald Trump. Brentick, I'm going to have to treat you like a brony Scott and read it in my head first <laughs> before I spew out <laughs> your words. But you got a point. Prosperity is not so much that it is bad, it's just abused. I think we have taken something and went crazy and bonkers over it, and it is not edifying the body. That can be a problem that needs to be changed. This is a problem that I'm seeing. So the tongue enters into our houses of worship and it taints us, and we're offended, and now we have church hurt, and we leave there and go to another church where we bump into more church hurt. Yes. And we stay there for as long as we can, and then we get hurt, and we leave there and go to another church and get hurt again because of what somebody said. And before you know it, three strikes you're out, and now... You leave church and you never return. The scripture talks about it is difficult to win back a man who has been offended. Uh, it's so poetic that it says that it is easier to catch the wind in your hand. <laughs> and I might be putting two analogies together because... One, it talked about dwelling in the house with a contentious woman. It is better to dwell on the rooftop. Well, you can put those two stories together and it makes sense that it's still. It's, it's, it's really like catching the wind in your hand. It, it's, actually, it says it is, it is difficult to win a person back to God it would be like trying to win over a city that have bars or, or bricks or an embankment or what have you. It's, you're trying to be a, a superman, a troop, and bust through these brick walls with your bare hands. It's difficult to do that, like it's difficult to win a person back into the fold after they've been offended. It didn't say it's impossible. It's just hard to do that. So what do you do? Study to be quiet. It's, again, James bring up some great practical things. Be quick to shut your mouth. You're like, I got to tell her off. No, ladies, be quick to shut up. Brothers, I think it's just important that you just be cool. Don't say nothing. Nothing. Don't do it because you feel like it's you need to put out this fire, but you got fire. Now you're trying to put fire out with fire, and you're going to burn the whole church down. So it's best to just shut your mouth. Don't say nothing. Be quiet. Sit down and listen. Pay attention to the whole matter. And then speak after you got some good information. Yeah, I like how verse uh, chapter 4 talks about humility. 
from whence come wars and fightings among you? He's asking the question, why are y'all fighting so much? Come they not hence even of your lust, that war in your members, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain it, you fight and war, yet you don't even have because you don't ask. And then you ask, you don't get because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. Mm -hmm. Submit yourself, therefore, to God and resist the devil and watch him get up out of here. He said, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, <laughs> and purity your hearts. And he says, you're double-minded, but afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Here, here it is. Speak not evil one of another. Brethren, he that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who was able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Who are you? when y'all judging one another, all right? And that's a, whole, that's a whole lesson and story within itself. Be quick to be quiet, y'all. Talk to your brother one-on-one. -on -one. If you got an ought an, an with them, pick up the phone and call them and say, I have an ought with you. Let's go for dinner, lunch, or let's pray on the phone and squash this so that we could continue to advance the kingdom. Put some tape over your mouth if you can't do that, uh, go somewhere and hide and uh, talk to the Lord. Coming up right now is a G-Hop. It's Thursday, y'all. And if that's not enough for you, well, <laughs> brand new gospel music is coming on with some Snoop Dogg. Y'all talking about Snoop to the dog of the dog? Well, for those of you who haven't heard the music, D. Curtis Randall is getting ready to play it for one hour, and then you're going to understand what's going on in the world of gospel. Also teaching, thank you, Deatrice, leaving work. We'll catch you on the rebound. Will we rhyme? Thank you, ma'am, and I'll talk tonight on this as well. Tell grandmama, leave the house right now. She's not allowed in the house because D. Curtis Randall is on right now. So what's the Jones show? Hit the share button if you will. For those of you who are on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and be quiet unless you got some good, whole, old fashioned, sweet smelling spiritual sauce <laughs> that you want to lend to someone. Stop being so angry. I think one of the problems we have in, in the Christian world is that we're angry with one another. For some reason, we're angry. And this anger builds up something that you can't get rid of. Uh, it's poison. You need healing. Many of you need healing. Bronia, thank you. If Bronia said that was good, that was good. I don't think y'all understand. If Bronia Scott said that was good, Man, good Lord. All right, the So Walter Jones uh, show is going black tonight, midnight. We are turning Facebook off for a few days. Uh, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. It's only a test. So if you, uh, if you go on my wall after midnight tonight and well, if you can't go on my wall, it ain't going to be there. Don't worry, I didn't block you. We're just going black for a few days. And if something like breaking news happened, I'll come back for some breaking news because many people, especially African Americans, don't watch the news. And I have a lot of, uh, I've got a few thousand uh, subscribers on YouTube that I must inform. So... You might have to catch me over there, but I'll come back for breaking news. Other than that, 
we are turning off the lights of Facebook for a little while, and we'll be back whenever we can. If you need to reach me, call my, my cell phone. And if you don't have my cell phone, we probably don't know each other. All right. Hit the share button. We'll talk to you later. The other Riding Jones will be back next week. Pray for him. He's in Phoenix, Arizona with Larry Jones. But they will be back. All right. This is the So Walter Jones Show. Pray for us in Chicago. Snow is coming. Schools are closed tomorrow. And I'm on my way to Evanston, Illinois. So I'm going to fight it on the way home and pray my safety back home. It's a long trip. But I got to do what I got to do. Unless we call off. But they ain't called it off yet. So I got to go. So what the jump show?